September 28, 2011. I had the honor and privilege to be interviewing William Weld in New York City for the Richard Nixon Oral History Program. Mr. Weld, thank you for joining us today. Uh, please tell us how you came to be involved with the, in the inquiry. I got a call in uh, the fall of 1973. I was an associate at a law firm in Boston asking me if I'd be interested in interviewing for a job on the impeachment staff. At that point, it really hadn't gotten off the ground. Uh, I said, no, I have to stay here until I make partner. And then I called the guy back 15 seconds later, having realized I made a dreadful mistake, and said, can I still interview for it? He said, yes. So I went, uh, I had a telephone interview with Sam Garrison, who at that point was running the Republican side of the staff, who was not yet fully unified. Some thought it never was. Uh, and uh, I went down, met with Sam, had a good interview with him, and uh, I was engaged to come in quite shortly thereafter and reported for duty in December 1973. Um, tell us a little bit about, about uh, first of all, about Sam Garrison. Give us a word picture of him, please. Uh, he was a devoted uh, family man, I think from the South, from uh, Richmond, and uh, he worked like a tiger, slept in on Sunday mornings, but that was about it. And he and I uh, had a good personal relationship. Uh, you were there before John Doerr was named. I'm sure I was there before Burt Jenner. Uh, maybe it was before John Doerr. I remember showing up for work, and uh, if I was the first staffer, Hillary Rodham from Yale Law School was the second staffer, and I remember John Doerr uh, calling us into his office saying, okay, uh, Bill, Hillary, we have uh, we have a, a research project here. We have to find out what constitutes grounds for impeachment of a president, and there doesn't seem to be any case directly on point. So let's see, it's Friday afternoon. I don't want to ruin your weekend. Uh, why don't you, you know, have the memo on my desk Tuesday morning? We said, fine, chief, and uh, looked around and looked around. And uh, six months later, after 40 lawyers had gone blind trying to uh, figure out what the answer to that question was, we. Uh, decided that the, the answer to the question really resided in the newspapers of the time, not in, uh, not in decided law cases. Um, some of the literature that's been written about the committee suggests that you and John Davidson wrote a minority opinion on the grounds for constitution, uh, for the constitutional grounds for impeachment. I know we wrote a minority memo on the right of uh, Jim St. Clair, my future law partner, to cross-examine witnesses. Uh, I'm not sure that we ever wrote a formal minority memo. Uh, the, the big question in the early days was, does the grounds for impeachment have to be a crime? And I can remember being of the view early on that really it should be required that it be a crime or, or there's no stopping point and uh, any president could be impeached for anything and the only check would be political. Well. Uh, you know, the ultimate memo that, uh, that we filed, uh, all filed, said, well, what if a president uh, took up a life of pleasure in a foreign land? That uh, might not be a crime under U.S. statutory law, but it certainly would be grounds for removal from office. And I found and find that rather persuasive. And I guess the dirty little secret is that the only check is political. Uh, I remember <coughs> early on, Congressman Gerald Ford, future President Ford, had said uh, an impeachable offense is whatever um, a majority of the House and two-thirds of the Senate uh, say it is. And everyone said, oh, poor Jerry Ford uh, played too much football without a helmet, really doesn't understand anything. And after the 40 lawyers had spent months on this, Joe Woods, who was the head of the Watergate task force, I remember stated publicly, you know what Congressman Ford said was really a, a terse but profound statement of the definition of an impeachable offense. Did you find your own view shifted? I think my own view shifted a little bit. I was, I was worried about the bright line criminal uh, crime requirement early on and uh, ultimately came to the view that uh, impeachment was a remedy uh, directed at uh, a defect uh, usually between the branches uh, of the government, usurping uh, the powers or functions of another branch, or perhaps dereliction, uh, uh, failing to discharge uh, the duties incumbent on you for your branch. Uh, we, we set a lot of store by the take care clause. The president takes an oath to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. And there was a feeling, I think, that uh, in the, uh, the whole mess with uh, the Watergate conspiracy and the misuse of the FBI and the CIA, 
that the president had not taken care that the laws be faithfully executed. And, and that, you know, it took a while to get there. There was a lot of floundering around. Was there an, a, a sense, how, how did you in your own mind separate the actions of the lieutenants from the president? Or did you come to the conclusion that the president is responsible for the actions of his lieutenants? You mean Haldeman and Ehrlichman? I mean Haldeman and Ehrlichman and Dean? Yeah. I, the, most of the, I didn't listen to all the tapes, but I listened to a lot of them. And uh, uh, Haldeman and Ehrlichman and the president all seemed to be on the same page. Uh, I would say the president was not going, oh, really? That's an interesting idea. He was, he was right there with them. Uh, there's no question of parasite and host here. Um, since you mentioned him, t could you give us a word picture of Jim St. Clair, James St. Clair, since you were his partner later? Later. Um, Jim came in and, uh, you know, he's a, even at that point he was a cooney old trial lawyer. And uh, my one abiding memory of him is I was presenting the case for the committee on an article uh, based on impoundment of funds, failure to uh, expend funds that had been appropriated. Uh, I think a lot of it was Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act. Uh, and so I said, well, here's the case for impoundment. And then I said, and here's the arguments uh, the other way. And Bob McClory from Illinois said, well, are there any uh, other possible defenses uh, that the president should raise? And this was right in the thick of all the fight over the documents in the Supreme Court and whether the president could withhold documents. And I said, yes, based on case A, B, and C, I said very proudly, uh, the president could stand upon the ground in the defense of sovereign immunity. And St. Clair was seated, you know, three feet to my right. And he just collapsed laughing because obviously that was such bad politics at the time. <laughs> um, what, uh, w tell us a bit <coughs> about the effect that uh, Burt Jenner had when he joined well, Bert was uh, the original, you know, class A uh, litigator. He had argued uh, Witherspoon against Illinois in the U.S. Supreme Court and made the case turn by saying, well, your honors need not reach this issue. You can decide upon this narrow ground, and they went for it immediately. I mean, he's a highly, highly distinguished uh, lawyer. Uh, the interesting thing was that, an interesting thing, was that uh, John Doerr had this very strong view that we wanted to have a unified staff. And, uh, you know, my playmates were mostly uh, Hillary Rodham, John Leibovitz, Dagmar Hamilton, uh, to some extent Joe Woods, uh, but I also worked closely with uh, John Davidson, John Whitman, and Sam Garrison on the Republican side. Uh, but I was, you know, welcome in both camps. Uh, I'm not sure everybody was welcome in both camps, and I think the uh, the hardcore of the Watergate task force, I'm not aware that that had any Republicans on it. So the evidence of the Watergate conspiracy, I think, was mainly developed by the, the Democratic staff. And they were not, they were not quite so uh, partisan as the congressman from Texas, who at a Democratic caucus was asked, well, what's the, what's the theme of uh, Jack Brooks? Okay. What's the theme of this uh, Article 2 about agency abuse, FBI, CIA? It's all so confusing, I don't understand it. He took his cigar out of his mouth and said, the theme of this article is we're going to get that some bitch out of there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and staff weren't permitted to speak or think in, in such ways. But there's no question that uh, some of them were not uh, friendly to President Nixon. Was there some <coughs> pressure on the Republicans and the staff? When, as, because there are a number of minority members of the staff who were very disappointed. Um, with how things were going and how John Doerr was doing his job. Were there any pressures on you? Were they asking you questions? Were they? Oh, the Republican members of the, of the committee had a perfect right to have their own legal research done, and, and I did that. I, I think that minority memo you referred to earlier might have been about St. Clair's right of cross-examination because uh, we did do a formal memo for the minority members of the staff on that. And, and there would be the occasional, you know, research request from uh, Del Latta or Chuck Wiggins or Robert McClory, uh, somebody on the uh, uh, Dave Dennis, uh, Wiley Main, some of the Republican members, and, and we would, you know, do that. I thought we had that, uh, we had that obligation. On the other hand, um, I spent a lot of time with the Democrats. Now it may have helped that my job was on the legal constitutional side more than the factual development side. It might have made that easier. Once the, uh, uh, once the committee chose the broad 
interpretation of impeachable offenses or uh, crimes, high crimes and misdemeanors. What did you shift? <coughs> what, what, what were your, after February, what were you focusing on? You continue to work on the, the legal case or the? Yeah, I did a lot of work on the legal case. I, I listened to the uh, uh, tapes. I, I uh, by myself, developed and uh, proposed and presented to the committee the case on impoundment, which I think was Article 6, it was not accepted. It did get some votes. Um, and that took a lot of, uh, that one did involve more courts of law, because there had been, you know, 15 or 20 cases, uh, mostly slapping down the president's position, but some upholding it. So that was very law heavy. But that never got submitted to the committee, the sixth article, to, the, to my knowledge. Uh, it, it was submitted because I testified oh, before the committee. But, but they didn't, I don't believe really, they voted on it. No, well, yes they did. Uh, I think it was voted down 27 to 11 or something like that. Um, did you uh, play a role in, sh in <coughs> shaping any of the other articles? Um, I remember a lot of discussion about agency abuse. I don't think I ever had uh, Article 2. I don't think I ever had the, the blue pencil on that. I, I also had quite a lot of uh, exposure to Article 3, which I think w uh, dealt with the subpoenas and contempt of the subpoenas, if memory serves. Uh, and yes. I remember reading uh, the different versions of the uh, documents where the White House would have uh, erased the incriminating material on most copies, but one of them got through. And needless to say, that infuriated everybody on the staff. Um, were you, did you <coughs> participate in the decision or about retranscribing the tapes because the concern was that the White House transcripts were just not usable or not thorough enough? I, I was not a decision maker, but it was clear to me, having uh, listened to both the versions from the White House and the uh, perfected versions, that uh, that was absolutely true. I mean, later I became a a federal prosecutor and, uh, you know, we would expend a lot of blood, sweat and tears on those transcripts and, uh, you know, have the jury listen to the tape and have the transcript at the same time and the defense would always scream bloody murder and say that's not what that word says and then I became a civil litigator. Same thing, you know, the, the transcript of a, a tape is a, a huge uh, forensic development and whoever made that decision, I think it was probably uh, John Doerr, Burt Jenner, and Joe Woods, they were absolutely right. Uh, how <coughs> valuable were the materials that the Watergate Special Prosecution Force handed over? Uh, on the development of the Watergate conspiracy? I, I assume they were very valuable, but that really wasn't my hunt. Uh, I was not an Article One man. Okay. Um, what, what's the story with Burt Jenner and, and he, his, he sort of sh changes positions. <coughs> what, or was he was he forced out by the by the minority uh, you know the the minority leaders? Uh, I, I don't know about forced out. I mean, he, he was one of the prominent uh, lawyers in the United States, the founder of Jenner and Block, the great Chicago firm. Uh, so, a person like myself, having gone to an Ivy League law school and aspiring to be a you know kicker uh, litigation partner, you know, he was sky high as far as I was concerned. Uh, <clears throat> he formed the view pretty early on that the, the president was going to be impeached. I remember him saying that to me and a couple of other people in a car in March or April, and that was not yet in the newspapers, I don't think. Uh, so he got there pretty quickly, and uh, uh, he spent, uh, he and Dorr spent a lot of time uh, together, I think, and he would come and make presentations to uh, the Republican members, but uh, I, I don't think they ever felt uh, at ease with him. I remember at one point he was testifying and I think it was Del Latter from Ohio said, uh, well you say that Mr. Jenner, but I don't have to take your word for that. I saw that report you just filed about how prostitution should be legalized and that's not, that's not binding on me any more than what you're saying right now. And then one of the uh, Democratic members said, I hope the gentleman from Ohio will reflect upon what he said. And, well, Del Latta didn't need to reflect on <laughs> what he had said, but that's an example of the happy camaraderie on the committee. <laughs> uh, was there some tension between Garrison and Burt Jenner? Absolutely, uh, I, I do think so. I mean, Sam was considerably more conservative. Uh, you know, he he approached this. I won't say as a entirely as a partisan, but his view at the beginning was listen. If the President of the United States is going to be impeached and removed from office, somebody's got to give me a pretty damn good reason or we're going to be a banana republic. 
And, uh, you know, he was, uh, he had deep relationships with some of the conservative uh, members of the Republican uh, uh, wing uh, on the uh, committee. And I don't think Burt Jenner did. Uh, and uh, both of them tried very, very hard to be professional about it. But was there tension? Yeah, there was tension. But hadn't Garrison worked for Spiro Agnew? I forgot that, if that was true. <laughs> um, what, uh, did you play any role in shaping the statements of information, those big books that, that were handed to the committee? Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, again, not the, not the Article One Watergate conspiracy, but yeah, I think I may have had a role in some of the other stuff. Um, here's a question I have for you, uh, um, since you were working on the legal side. Uh, did, did you come to the understanding that, that this procedure was like a grand jury? There was some question as to whether uh, uh, Mr. St. Clair could, could be there and cross-examine, right? And then you right. thought of it. And how, and, and then I guess the issue was with a, in a grand jury, the defendant's counsel is not there. Most grand juries. Most grand some, some states have, uh, by statute, permitted defense counsel into but the room. But was this one of the sort of discussions that you? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of uh, arguments about whether the standard here was uh, probable cause. What's that, four out of nine? Was it preponderance, which is five out of nine? Was it clear and convincing? Uh, which is uh, seven out of nine? Was uh, it uh, beyond uh, a reasonable us, doubt? Uh, sorry, to, just to help the people watching, and me too. You mean five out of the nine jurors, right? I mean, would five out of no, nine? no percentage likelihood. A grand jury, if it finds a four out of nine chance that something has happened, that's probable cause. Uh, and and in different uh, types of legal proceedings, there are all types of different uh, uh, standards of proof required. Another one would be preponderance in a civil case, five out of nine or six out of 10, however you like. Uh, there's another standard in fraud cases, the requirement is clear and convincing evidence, and that's loosely translated as seven out of nine. Uh, then there's uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, which is uh, sometimes translated as nine out of 10. So, <clears throat> you know, the people who wanted uh, the president to be impeached were saying, well, this is just a probable cause, we don't have to prove this damn thing. And then other people would say, well, this is a rather important proceeding. And uh, if, uh, if we're going to you know, send the guy who's president of the United States over the Senate to get removed from office, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more important than a speeding ticket. And maybe the standard should be a little bit different. And yeah, I can remember doing a good bit of legal research on all those things and analogizing this to various different kinds of proceedings. But the fact is, there's almost no judicial proceeding which is analogous. This is a quintessentially legislative proceeding. And that's why I say ultimately the check is political. It's not, um, it's not some statute. It's not some uh, rule. Uh, sure, there's high crimes and misdemeanors, but you can put whatever water into that vessel you care to. How useful was the Johnson <coughs> precedent? Uh, I, I thought Johnson was, was very useful. Uh, and uh, there was a 1934 case involving a judge, I think, called Willis Ritter, which was also uh, useful to me. Uh, uh, in the end, by the way, uh, on Article Two, which is the one you said you worked on, right, you thought about a little bit, um, did, did, did you reach four, five, six, or nine out of ten in the end? On the agency abuse? Yeah, in your own mind. Well, it's pretty clear he'd done it because I listened to those tapes. Uh, the question on that article was, you know, has too much uh, potpourri been jammed in the same glass jar? Is this a, a single cognizable offense? But, uh, but the evidence uh, behind that was a lot of the same evidence that was in the Watergate case, and that was, that was just there. The question is, it, it, on it, tape. I mean, how many times does a president have to do it for it to be too many? Is one enough? If you have one instance that you prove. Yeah. I mean, uh, if a president said once, well, maybe we could encourage the CIA to get involved here because that would, you know, maybe dissuade the FBI or complicate their efforts. Even once, if it was to dissuade the FBI in a case that was aimed at the president's breastplate, that might be enough. Of course, it's like perjury. A perjury prosecution partakes of the color of the underlying offense here. In that case, the obstruction, I think, kind of partakes of the color of the underlying offense. And if you didn't have the underlying evidence, then maybe you'd say this is too artificial. Before the vote, 
did you sense that there that there was going to be bipartisan support for some of these articles before the votes on the three uh, on, yeah, on the articles? I'm trying to remember the timing, but yeah, it was pretty clear there was going to be some bipartisan uh, support, some Republicans going along, and and there was a very dramatic moment I remember um, involving Chuck Wiggins. And I think it was when the smoking gun tape was played, which was June of 1972, and I'm not sure when this meeting occurred. Uh, but there had been a diehard group of uh, perhaps nine or ten Republicans who were with the president all the way, and their legal leader uh, was Chuck Wiggins, who later became quite a distinguished appellate judge out in California, I think. A very learned, scholarly man. He would make arguments like, well, you have made an election, and therefore you cannot argue this. And that's pretty legalistic. But so uh, someone brought in the tape of the smoking gun tape to play for these diehards. And they played it and, you know, the nine diehards sort of realized they'd been played for fools. Uh, I often heard the effort of defending the president referred to as a draining effort. And if anyone had been drained, they had. And Chuck Wiggins, the ultimate, you know, strong, silent type, burst into tears. And I've got to situate this because the, the Supreme Court doesn't rule that these have to be turned over until July 29th after the votes. So, so the committee listened to this tape after the Supreme because he, this would have been after the votes that they'd taken. So they listened to the June 23rd, 72 <coughs> tape um, after the Supreme, not before, the, it couldn't have been before the Supreme Court proceeding because the president hadn't turned I, it over. I would have said that the Supreme Court ordered that the tapes had to go over sometime in May. Maybe there was a few tapes. No, it was July 29th. Well, that's 10 days before he resigns. Yeah, yeah. well, that's what... So maybe that meeting was in that interval. Oh, my goodness. That must have been very powerful. <laughs> um, uh, did you have an aha moment when you were going through the materials? As you said, you're... You well, listening to the tapes. And do you yeah. remember... What, what, did, did, do you remember, was that... May, June, uh, they, they would have been, do you, do you remember when you listened to the tapes? No. But it was conversations between the President and Haldeman and President Ehrlichman and John Dean had a bit part in, in some of them. And I remember thinking, boy, everyone really keeps their voice down in, in the Oval Office, you know, no, no screaming and, and uh, ranting and raving. On the other hand, what's being said is pretty amazing. <laughs> Tell us about John Doerr, working with him. Oh, he was a uh, dreamboat, dreamboat. Uh, he uh, was just uh, so uh, sort of apple pie good. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew that uh, he, he made a real effort to uh, uh, not socialize with any of his Democratic friends in Washington. He was quite a good friend of Ethel Kennedy, and uh, at the time, I spent a little bit of time out at Hickory Hill, and Ethel was always saying, that John Doerr, he won't even, you know, return my telephone calls. It's really, it's really awful. Um, but one time, uh, uh, John took exception to the fact that, I think it was I had written a memo for Mr. Hutchison of Michigan, who is the ranking member at the request of Sam Garrison. Uh, and I think Sam asked me to deliver it to Mr. Hutchinson. And uh, John said, well, I, you know, I didn't know about this. So I got, I got caught in the middle on that. And I was kind of in the middle since I was friendly with both sides. And I often say I've had a lot of different jobs in law and politics. And I've been uh, a house, house liberal in a conservative administration, uh, witness uh, the Ed Meese Justice Department in the 80s. And I've been a house conservative in a liberal administration, witness the Nixon uh, impeachment, and I don't like either one. I'd rather be right in the middle in a middle-of-the-road administration, so I had to go get my own administration. <laughs> um, tell us, please, <coughs> about working with Hillary Rodham. Very close uh, relationship, very, uh, very decent. Uh, uh, she's just a very decent person, and uh, if I recall correctly, on the occasion when I got in the middle and, and John Doerr himself got frowny-faced with me, which he should not have, by the way, I was uh, doing my duty. Uh, I think I think Hillary intervened and defended me on that, and I've never forgotten that. Frowny face? He got frowny face? Yeah, he did. He was saying, I, I should have known about this. How did this happen? Um, tell us about uh, what happens 
uh, at, because you're, you're, you were going to tell us a story about what happens after this experience, years later. Well, um, you know, this was the, the beginning of a lifelong career in litigation and politics for me. I went, went back to my law firm, transferred from the corporate department into litigation, ran for state attorney general in 1978 because I was so uh, obsessed with the investigative possibilities of uh, grand juries and thought that the AG's office was not doing as much as it could have. I was absolutely creamed uh, in that one. Uh, but then uh, when Reagan was elected, I was, you know, I, I was a Republican who maybe knew how to try a case. So I was uh, appointed U.S. Attorney and then uh, uh, had a lot of uh, public corruption cases there, went to Washington as head of the criminal division, uh, then went back to Massachusetts, ran for governor and uh, won. But before that happened, I was practicing law as a litigator. Uh, minding my own business uh, in a Philadelphia hotel room preparing a witness for something and 25 years after uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, after that happened, 1999, 25 years after the Watergate case, after the impeachment, uh, I get a call from John Podesta who was then President Clinton's chief of staff. Uh, and uh, I'd known him through the Clinton White House because President Clinton and I had been friendly as governors and then he had nominated me to be ambassador to Mexico. So during a couple of months, I spent a lot of time in the White House with uh, John Podesta and Rahm Emanuel and other senior members of the staff. So he calls me up in 99, January of 99. He says, looks like they're going to impeach my guy and they're going to hold hearings in the House. And uh, near as we can tell, there's a, a couple of people in this country who know a lot about uh, the law, constitutional law of impeachment of a president, and the other one of them is very much disqualified by interest. So you have to testify as an expert witness for the defense on the law, which I was happy to do, and, and did. <laughs> Tell us about that experience, just doing it. Well, uh, I think I went in with a bunch of other former U.S. attorneys uh, who were also Republicans. It was a pretty impressive panel and um, and I had the additional background of knowing the law of impeachment and I said sex is not an impeachable offense uh, it just isn't it has to be something that touches and concerns the office or usurpation of power uh, this is a non-starter as a matter of constitutional law and they said well what about perjury you you brought a lot of perjury cases when you were a prosecutor in Boston I said yes but but as I was saying earlier a perjury prosecution partakes of the color of the underlying offense. I once prosecuted a guy for perjury for denying that he'd been in Boston uh, on November uh, 28, 1981. You may say, why bring that case? Because that was the date of the Great Lynn Fire. It almost burnt down the city of Lynn. He was a known torch arsonist, and uh, he claimed to have been in uh, Florida. But an agent for ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, found his fingerprints on a... Uh, uh, ticket at the Delta uh, warehouse in Atlanta and proved that he'd come up and then flown back to uh, Tampa. So that's a perjury case. It, maybe it's kind of like the Al Capone income tax evasion case. You're, you're really getting at something else uh, and uh, you would never prosecute somebody for perjury for falsely denying that they'd had a tryst with some lady of their acquaintance. Just to, it would be beneath the dignity of the law. Do you remember when you learned that President Nixon was going to resign? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I had had a long-standing <laughs> commitment to go fishing uh, with my brother and some friends on uh, August 9th. So I told Sam, I'd gone back to Boston, Sam called me up, said he needed more help, so I went back for a few weeks, but I said, uh, you know, August, August 7th or whatever it was, I gotta be out of here. So I was on uh, a small boat in a fjord in uh, Iceland and looked down at the bottom of the boat and there was, you know, a newspaper from uh, a couple of days ago with uh, uh, a photograph of, uh, I guess, President Ford taking the oath of office. So I was in a fjord in, uh, near Reykjavik, Iceland. What did you think of the pardon? <clears throat> uh, it, it's a tough one. I, I don't think I would have done it. Uh, but I didn't have the stereoscopic view of the harm to the country. Um, you know, I, I mean, this experience made me a real prosecutor. Uh, and I, I, I've had 
prosecutive instincts for a long time. Maybe, maybe I didn't. Maybe they weren't honed in 1974. But I, I think even then I wouldn't have done it. What did this experience teach you about our system of government? Well, uh, the wheels may grind slowly, but uh, they they grind pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of force uh, in the law, and uh, it made the president do a lot of things he didn't want to do, and. Uh, the whole procedure involved um, a lot of things that a lot of people didn't want to have done. But uh, I mean, there are three countries in the world that I associate with the capacity for self-examination. Uh, one is Israel, one is the United Kingdom, uh, and the third, and uh, perhaps the greatest, uh, is the United States. Uh, did you stay in touch, besides the 1999 story, did you stay in touch with Hillary Rodham after? Oh yeah. No, I've, I've known her. Uh, pretty, uh, pretty continuously. I mean, there were whispered conversations about Bill in 1974. They were married the next year, same year I was married. Uh, and, and the Bill in question with the whispers was not Bill Weld. <laughs> it was Bill Clinton. I, I never did see him uh, vi visiting there. But uh, then uh, he and I went to the same college at Oxford a year apart and had uh, some very good uh, mutual friends so that uh, by the time I became governor, I just couldn't wait to meet this guy who I'd heard so much about. So I've known Hillary Rodham, now Hillary Rodham Clinton, in, in lots of different uh, contexts. You said that this launched your career. Well, in a sense that I became interested in the criminal law, went back and ran for state attorney general, and that led to everything else. That, that led to being appointed U.S. attorney, which led to being head of the criminal division in Washington, which led to being elected governor of Massachusetts. Uh, have I uh, forgotten or uh, been unable to elicit any stories no, that you'd like to No, that's, uh, that's a wrap, as that's we say in Hollywood, yeah. Governor, okay. Ambassador, thank you, Bill <laughs> Well. It's been a thank pleasure. You, Tim. Thank you. Thanks.